People with an interest in 20th century history will not need an introduction to the work of Richard Overy. By his own estimate, he has been writing about the build-up to and course of the Second World War for 40 years. His most recent book, Blood and Ruins, has been labelled in many reviews his magnum opus, in part, I suppose, because it can be viewed as a summation of those decades of study, thought and authorship, and in part because it has the bulk, just short of a thousand pages, which encourages that description. People with an interest in 20th century history will doubtless have one or more of Overy's previous books on their shelves. The Morbid Age and the Interwar Crisis, about the period between the wars, and then an extensive contribution to study of the Second World War. He has written to great acclaim about the air war and his other books have been uniformly praised. So, does his new book have anything new to say? As early as the dust jacket, it promises that it does, subtitling the work The Great Imperial War 1931-1945. The idea that the book will unpick the label and deliver a particular insight into what has been called the Long Second World War sold out the first print, meaning that many booksellers, as I speak, are taking orders. The dates in the subtitle set up the argument. There is a prologue which concedes that, in Overy's words, the First World War and the violence that preceded and followed it profoundly influenced the world of the 1920s and 1930s. But he starts his narrative in 1931 because he sees Japan's invasion of Manchuria in that year as the start of the Great Imperial War. We arrive there on page 32. The organisation of the book is unusual. The first three chapters offer a narrative of admirable clarity, 1931-1945, and occupy the first 370-odd pages. They hold the interest because Professor Overy knows how to write. But they don't offer anything new to anyone who has read widely on the period. The remaining eight chapters and 500 pages are organised topically. Overy explains in the preface that the outline, chapters 1 to 3, provides the framework to the thematic chapters in which key questions are explored. The themes that Overy explores include total war, war economics, I was particularly taken by him characterising economies geared up for total war as producers of weapons of mass production, civilian wars and crimes and atrocities. Those chapters, they are really standalone essays, are worth reading for their information, their clarity and sometimes their deep dive into aspects of the struggle that are frequently ignored. But for me, the sum of the parts proves to be indistinct. I'm not sure that the concept, the structure, works. The first part is just that, the first part, done and dusted before moving on to the second, where standalone chapters very rarely cause the reader to reflect back on the, as it were, primary narrative. The most frequent reason for feeling resonance with the earlier chapters is awareness of repetition. Overlap between the two sections is inevitable, and the chapter Fighting the War is particularly a partial return to covered ground. It is also, and it is perhaps unfair to expect otherwise, a reminder of Overy's other books, particularly his highly praised Why the Allies Won. The promise of the book is big picture stuff. In the preface, Overy writes, the argument presented here is that the long Second World War was the last imperial war. And in his final chapter, he essays persuasively the idea that the war defeated imperialism, taking down the empires of both Axis and allies. 
Rather disappointingly, though, this insight, though judiciously hinted at by using the word imperialism from time to time, occupation of Poland was continuation of the imperial project already begun in the Czech lands, does not have the effect of drawing the skeins of argument together. How, for example, does a 21-page section, roughly 9,000 words, on radio and radar support or develop or address this thesis? Example. The initial priority was to produce a microwave air interception radar and a microwave gun laying radar for automatic... See what I mean? My all-time favorite book review was by Abraham Lincoln. He said, for those who like this sort of thing, this is the sort of thing they will like. But I confess to having found blood and ruins a bit of a test of stamina. And because of passages like that, where the overriding thought for me is that everything from 40 years of study has been hoovered up, but at the expense of developing the cogent argument that was promised. A case of wood and trees. A chapter entitled The Emotional Geography seems to promise something original, perhaps provocative. What we get is 15 and a half pages on the reaction to and treatment of neuropsychiatric cases in the armed forces, and then 10 and a half on discipline and coercion used to deal with desertion and failure to fight. I'm back with Abraham Lincoln. For me, not part of an argument that the war was the last imperial war. The chapter, Just Wars, question mark, Unjust Wars, question mark, on the other hand, is half chronicle, half meditation on the moral dimension of the war, and for it alone, Blood and Ruins is close to essential reading. Oddly, there are cases where I think the author has seriously undervalued an event. For example, we read of a major frontier battle with Soviet forces on the heights of Nomenhan, which ended with an armistice. Close quotes. And that is all we read. But the battle at Nomenhan, also known as Kalkin Gol, was the first clash between two armies using modern mobile armor, was the first advertisement of the battlefield Naus of Georgi Zhukov, and was basic to the weakening of Japan's Go North faction and strengthening of the Go South strategy. All really quite important when you're thinking about an imperial war. The obvious danger in trying not to leave anything out is not putting enough of everything in. Finally, the sort of cavil that will get me a bad name, but is this trivial? The production of the book, specifically its binding, is wholly unsatisfactory. The paper is a bit see-through, but that's not terrible. The fact that I turned page 325 of my brand new copy to discover that pages 327 to 332 were loose is and I've seen others making the same complaint on notice boards, and this is not a cheap book. Richard Overy concludes his book and his elusive argument, the Second World War, more than the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars or the First World War, created the conditions for transforming not just Europe, but the entire global geopolitical order. Thanks to Blood and Ruins, you will either agree with or be unable to simply dismiss his conclusion. This is a good book, even if not entirely the book I was expecting. I wouldn't be without any of the half dozen ovary books I have on my shelves, and I wouldn't be without this one either. <laughs>